Hello, this is Dr. Jabour, and today I'm going to go over cell organelles. I'm not sure why this uh, presentation doesn't have a a, uh, <laughs> a first slide, but with a title, a title slide, but that's okay. So we're going to talk about cell organelles. In a previous lecture, you learned um, that the cell is the smallest unit of life. There are two types of cells, prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are the more sophisticated ones with organelles in them. Prokaryotic cells are the more primitive ones with uh, basically a cytosol and um, and then floating things in the cytosol, like uh, the genetic material in the form of DNA and free-floating ribosomes. And of course, there's you know other molecules and solute and solutes in there. But what we're concentrating on in this particular chapter are the cell organelles in eukaryotic cells. Eukary... You... <laughs> um, what am I doing? Eukaryotic cells, right? Organelles are not found in prokaryotic cells because that's that's really the big difference between the two types of cells. Eukaryotic cells have these additional um, little compartments within the cell. Okay, so uh, that's what this chapter is about. So it's only about eukaryotic cells and what those compartments are. What are these organelles? What do they do? What are their individual functions? So I'm going to actually draw an overview of an eukary eukaryotic cells and basically give you the, the big picture of all the organelles and kind of as a, in a big picture tell you uh, basically the flow of information from one organelle to the next and it will help you see how everything is kind of tied together and then we'll dive into each individual organelle, how it's how it's really constructed, and what what is the exact function of it, and and the nitty gritty. But I don't want to get into the nitty gritty before I give you the big picture because uh, otherwise you really don't see where everything is really um, in relationship to each other. So I'm gonna draw this big oval. Perfect. And um, just literally, this is uh, just kind of off the cuff here. So this is the cell, and this is the cell, the edge of the cell, right? So this would be the cell membrane, the plasma membrane, the phospholipid bilayer. I only drawing one line, uh, but really, if we zoomed in, we would see, you know, the phosphate, the height, the polar heads of the phospholipids and the hydrophobic tails facing each other like this and basically creating the core of this membrane. This is very hydrophobic because of those tails. Uh, they're just basically carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, very hydrophobic. And then the polar heads, which are those phosphate groups in, the, in a phospholipid, it's two fatty acids in a phosphate group. The phosphate group is the polar head that's facing the aqueous environments on the inside and the outside of the cell. This is all aqueous, which means it's a fluid that's aqueous-based, means water-based. So you need to be able to face the water and create bonds with the water. And you can only do that if you're polar and you create hydrogen bonds with the water. Okay, so this was discussed in a previous chapter. All right, so this is like the zooming in of the cell membrane, but from now on, we just write a line. And every time you see a line, it's basically a membrane. So one of the first organelles that I just want to introduce you to is the nucleus. And the nucleus actually happens to be a double membrane. So I'm going to draw double lines. And maybe I'll do this. And then this. And then I'll just do kind of just one line just to make it a little bit easier this okay so it's really a double membrane double membrane and then there are holes so this is the nucleus and the nucleus has uh, nuclear pores so this is one pore there's another pore another pore and it's basically these 
um, entrances to the nucleus. So what's inside the nucleus? We have the famous uh, DNA molecule. So that's your genetic material right here. There's your typical DNA molecule. There we go. So this is DNA inside the nucleus. So in a eukaryotic cell, your genetic material is in a very safe uh, space um, that is where, where your genetic information is basically protected, included, and it's only there. The DNA is not allowed to leave the nucleus. It stays in the nucleus. So the nucleus, oops, I forgot an L here, nucleus, the nucleus houses the genetic material. That's the definition of nucleus. So if in a test question, you would have to like have an organelle and have the function of the organelle, you have to know what or each organelle does. So nucleus houses the genetic material in the form of DNA. Okay, so let's, uh, and this, let, let me introduce you to what happens to the genetic material. That way it will actually help me introduce you to the next organelles. So what happens to the genetic, genetic material? Let's talk about that. Um, so how do you go from creating something that the cell would need? For example, if it needs more protein channels in the membrane, we talked about protein channels in a previous chapter. Uh, these are little proteins embedded in the membrane. Let's do them in blue like this. Is right. What if they need? What if the cell needs more of these protein channels? Let's say uh, the cells in the kidneys lining up the kidneys. All of a sudden, we need more water retention because blood pressure dropped. And one way of re increasing blood pressure is to bring water out of the urine back into the blood. Okay, so kidney cells are going to want to increase the number of what we call aquaporins on the surface of the cell membrane. So uh, the cells can absorb the water back out of the urine, which, you know, the urine would be, you know, out here. And it can take that water and dump it back into the blood. That way it increases blood volume back up and blood pressure will come back up and, you know, it will, it will prevent um, blood pressure from dropping too low. So increasing the number of aquaporins, that means, oh my gosh, we need to make more of these proteins so we can kind of like pluck them into this membrane so we can allow more water to come out. So how do we create a new aquaporin? That's a protein. What's the recipe to make this protein? The code to make this protein is in the DNA molecule. So I'm going to use um, a slightly different blue here. And let's assume that the code to make an aquaporin is on in this particular section of the D, this particular DNA molecule. So I happen to only have drawn one DNA molecule. Human cells have 23 pairs of DNA molecules. That means they have 46 DNA molecules. There's 46 chromosomes in a human cell. I only drew one just to make it simpler. And every one of our DNA molecules holds the genetic information that makes up everything that makes up you, every cell. Everything that you need to build a cell is coded in the DNA molecule. It's crazy, right? So to make an aquaporin protein, there is a code to make that. And that code happens to be, I'm just kind of like um, arbitrarily saying it's here. Right, so there's a code here in this particular section of the DNA where, you know, let me not draw it like that. Right, so here it is. I'm gonna draw it like this in this, in this, in this orientation. So the, the, and so this code is called a gene. Right? So right here, we have the gene for aquaporin. So I'm just gonna write aquaporin here. This is turning out to be a great example here. Aquaporin. So the cell needs more aquaporin because the cell decides to take up more 
water molecule out of the urine and to dump it back into the blood. How do we make aquaporin? Let's go read the recipe in the book. So I describe, this is the way I describe DNA and the genes, is think of cookbooks. And you have so many different cookbooks for you know, many different recipes. Humans have 23 cookbooks. That's how I describe the 23 types of chromosomes that human cells have. And there is a cookbook to make um, Italian recipes. There's a cookbook to make French recipes. There's a cookbook to make Lebanese recipes, right? Different, different, completely different cookbooks. And every single chromosome will have specific recipes for something that's completely different than in another chromosome that's holding a different recipe to make something different, right? So everyone is different. So if I want the recipe for aquaporin, it's going to be only in one particular chromosome that happens to be holding that particular recipe that doesn't exist in a different country, right? If I have all these different cookbooks from different countries. So the gene for aquaporin is on a specific DNA molecule. So we don't really care which one in this particular example here. But it's in a very specific location also. So imagine it's a specific page of your cookbook. You have the recipe on that page. Okay. So I describe my cookbooks as being so precious that they are basically housed in a place called the nucleus that I'm going to um, uh, use uh, the analogy of the pantry in my kitchen. Um, these cookbooks are so ancient and, you know, passed down from generation to generation that they're, maybe their pages are very, you know, um, fragile. So we really don't want to like bring this cookbook into the kitchen where we're going to make these proteins, build them up and then, you know, be able to use them. So the DNA stays, all these molecules of DNA, they have to stay in the nucleus. So that's my pantry. But I want to need, I need the recipe and I need to go work in the kitchen. So I'm going to make a photocopy of just that page that I need the recipe for. And that's what happens when an RNA molecule is created. The RNA molecule is basically, and I'm going to color code here. I'm creating an RNA molecule. There it is. An RNA molecule, what it is, a messenger RNA molecule, it's basically a copy, this is a copy of just the gene of interest that codes for the protein of interest that we need, the cell all of a sudden happens to need more of. And this is constant in the life of a cell. It's, it's The cell is living and it constantly needs something and it destroys something else and old, something old that it just you know, breaks apart and then something new that it needs to build, it's constantly doing something. And here the cell needs more aquaporins. So the recipe to make aquaporin is in this gene. We need to make a copy of it because we cannot take the DNA out, but RNA is allowed to come out. So once we made a copy of this RNA molecule, the RNA molecule comes out and it comes out of the nucleus and it lands on what we call the endoplasmic reticulum. So I'm going to actually use a slightly different color for the endoplasmic reticulum. Let's use purple. The endoplasmic reticulum over here. The endoplasmic reticulum is like this big set of sacs. So it's they're like you know, um, these membranes that create these uh, very wide, um, they're flat and wide compartments, but they're very flat and stacked on top like that. And I'm gonna draw one more over here. And what they have on them, I'm going to draw them in pink so you can see them well. On top of this ER, we have ribosomes. Okay, and ribosomes, they also come free floating. 
All right. So ribosomes. ribosomes on top of the ER. So this is ER. There's your ER. This is rough ER over here. Um, rough endoplasmic reticulum. And this is smooth ER where there are no ribosomes attached on the surface. So here we're building a protein. So the RNA goes to the rough ER. So now I'm going to draw a zoomed in version of what's happening at the ribosomes. So the ribosomes, if we kind of like zoom in, zoom in, if we zoomed in on a ribosome, we would see two subunits of the ribosomes, a small subunit and a large subunit. These ribosomes, uh, so when you blow them up and you're able to see actually what are they made of, they're actually made of these two subunits. And what happens is these two subunits are going to clamp the RNA that's coming out of the nucleus. So they're waiting, waiting, waiting here. Maybe I'll draw a few more ribosomes here. They're waiting at the edge of these nuclear pores for an RNA to come out and they will clamp this RNA molecule on both sides and basically capture it. So this RNA over here, this RNA over here is caught by the ribosome. So if you, if you zoomed in here, this is what you would see. And what happens is that the ribosome is going to read the RNA and create a protein. So I'm not gonna go into the detail of that because it's actually the, you know, the, the topic of an upcoming chapter. But um, the bottom line here is that the rough ER is for the production of proteins. These ribosomes, um, maybe I'll do the proteins in the gene in blue, RNA in green, uh, proteins, why not red? Okay. So proteins, they need... Uh, amino acids. So I'm going to draw these little red circles are going to be my amino acids. So what happens is that ribosomes are going to read the code that's on the RNA molecule. They read the code and they go, oh, these three nucleotides means um, they code for alanine. So I need an alanine amino acid. And here's my first, oops, and here's my first amino acid. It's an alanine right here. And then the next three nucleotides on the RNA molecule codes for valine. So the ribosome goes and gets a valine. And then the next code and the next code and every code, every three nucleotides codes for a specific amino acid. And this little ribosome is like a little chef and it requires all these ingredients, which are my amino acids. These amino acids are going to be strung together into one long chain of amino acids. That will be my protein. So after the ribosomes have read the recipe, what's the copy of the recipe in on the RNA molecule, as it's reading this recipe, it's assembling the ingredients together. So it reads the code and it assembles what the code is telling it to assemble. So every three nucleotide code for valine, alanine, methionine, leucine, isoleucine, whatever those amino acids are, the, the ribosomes are gonna bring them together and create this long chain of amino acid. So rough ER, I'm gonna put an arrow here to show you that at the exit of rough ER, we have a protein that is being made. And a protein, is a string of amino acids. Okay, so these amino acids were strung together at the level of the ribosome. These little ribosomes clamped the RNA, read the RNA, assembled the amino acids into a protein. Perfect. Now, if we were coding for something that's not a protein and it was a lipid, we would go to the smooth ER. So in the smooth ER, we have 
uh, let's do lipids in yellow. Smoothie R. Smoothie R is the site of lipid synthesis. So this is lipid synthesis. And Ruffy R was protein synthesis. Sim, I'm like missing letters today. S I N T H. I totally forgot the H here. Okay. Protein synthesis. So again, typical test questions. You have the name of an organelle and the function of an organelle. You know, you need to know what is what's the function of each organelle. So rough ER is a site where proteins are assembled. Amino acids are assembled into a protein, and the protein is basically released out of the rough ER. If you're making a lipid, that will be assembled in the smooth ER. All right. So once these, um, let's add these amino acids a little bit up here instead. And let's erase those so we can use that space. Oh, that erase, I didn't, I forgot that when you erase something in a filled up area, it takes all of the filling out. Okay, that's not, that's not bad. So after the ER, you have what's called the Golgi. And I'm going to draw the Golgi in, uh, let's do, I don't know, uh, let's do in dark blue. So the Golgi is also another set of, we, we describe it as stack of pancakes. Okay, so there's the Golgi. And what happens in the Golgi is the protein, the protein that was created in the rough ER, so I'm gonna draw a protein here, right? This chain of amino acid. This protein chain of amino acid, what's going to happen is that it's going to arrive to the rough ER and go through the different stacks in the rough ER and be um, uh, uh, be retransformed. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The protein is going to get, it's going to mature in the, in the Golgi complex. So uh, when a protein is made, it's just a one long strand of amino acid. And that's basically what we call the primary sequence of a protein. Just one long string of amino acid. Valine, leucine, isoleucine, blah, 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 all in one long strand. Well, actually, proteins don't work that way. They get have to get folded and folded and folded again. And that happens in the Golgi. So that's where proteins mature. Whatever that string is, it needs to be folded. And every protein is folded in a different way. And some end up being folded into balls and some end up being folded into more of like, you know, more of a lengthy, lengthy shape. Um, in addition to folding, we also have decorations added on the proteins. So I call them decorations, but they're like carbohydrates. So we end up with glycoproteins and lipids will have that done too, to themselves as well. And you end up with a glycolipid. So here in the Golgi, uh, let's write it down. We have uh, uh, protein and lipid maturation. And this protein ends up, um, so I'm just going to draw like a little squiggle here to show you that it folded. This protein uh, maturation here, I'll write, I'll write folded and plus um, carbs. I'm gonna write carbs because little carbohydrates can get attached on the surface of proteins. And now you have a glycoprotein. Okay, so the protein then gets packaged into what we call vesicles. And this is another compartment in the cell. You see Golgi is a compartment. ER is a compartment. 
nucleus is a compartment and every single one of those have they each have a specific function to prepare the the the, the, the those molecules that will make up the cell so the vesicles they literally plop off the golgi complex so you see the stack of pancakes with what the golgi is um it's actually directional kind of like when i drew the red arrows in the 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 molecules come in on one side and then they get kind of folded and rearranged and they kind of plop off on the other side uh, or through vesicles. So the vesicles, they literally kind of like, they like pop off the Golgi and they get transported. And these vesicles, their job is to take whatever their content is to wherever it's supposed to go. So if it is an aquaporin that's going to end up in the plasma membrane, where do we need to go? We need to go to the plasma membrane. So this, this vesicle is going to travel all the way to the plasma membrane and you know fuse with the plasma membrane and you're going to end up with your aquaporin in the plasma membrane. So let's say here's an aquaporin that's being made and now we have the aquaporin that's going to be up on the surface of the cell like that. So once this is gone, uh, hopefully it doesn't erase my whole, my whole edge. Oh, it didn't, that's great. Um, you see the vesicle is going to, the vesicle, you see how it, fuses with the plasma membrane and then kind of like releases its content. Uh, if it happens to be a channel uh, in protein embedded in the membrane, then it's going to already be embedded in the vesicle here. The vesicle will fuse and will basically just, it'll be just a basically new section of the membrane. And now you have aquaporins in the membrane, more aquaporins in the membrane. But, you know, proteins, there's so many different kinds of proteins that it, some of them are just enzymes that are needed somewhere else in the cell, and that's where they're going to end up. They're just going to end up being dumped wherever they're needed. Okay, so these are vesicles. Um, what else we're going to discuss? A mitochondria. Mitochondria are, let's use orange for mitochondria. They're also double membrane, like the nucleus. And what's really cool is that the inner membrane is so much bigger than the outer membrane that it's forced to fold because it's bigger. So it's kind of like, you know, kind of like crammed in there and it folds inwards and that's it. So there's a mitochondrion and there's a reason for that folding and all that largeness on the inside. And you learn about that in uh, the topic of cellular respiration and all the details of how ATP is made. So that's what happens here. What we have in the mitochondria is the production of ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell. This is this carries energy, and when that ATP comes somewhere, um, and now I would, you know, if we were in a class together, I would ask you, you know, where is ATP used? I already gave you an example of where ATP is used um, in previous lectures. For example, at pumps, the sodium potassium pump that pumps ions against their gradient during active transport, uh, an ATP molecule is going to be used up for the energy it, 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 it contains to basically force these ions against their gradients. So mitochondria is a site for ATP production. Okay, what else? Um, okay, if I forgot anything, we're going to anyway see it in this upcoming slides. Well, I can, I can tell you about what's not an organelle, but it's something that we discuss in eukaryotic cells, are the cytoskeleton. So the cytoskeleton is a, a bunch of proteins that are part of this, basically the skeleton of the cell. They give the cell its shape. They create railroads inside the cell, literally to help things move within the cell. This is really, really cool. So you will have, you know, vesicles that are moving along these cytoskeletal proteins uh, that act as a guard 
like a railroad track for these vesicles to move towards wherever they're supposed to go. That's really cool. So this, these are cytoskeletal proteins. So I'm going to write here, cytoskeleton. Um, and we'll see their microtubules and actin filaments, and they have slightly different roles, but these are part of a cytoskeleton. So I'm going to draw some orange and some, some red, just so you can see there's different kinds and the details of those, you know, Um, they give the cell its shape, they act as, you know, railroad tracks for these vesicles to glide on. Um, during cell division, they'll help the chromosomes kind of migrate towards the pole of the cell. They're really kind of really cool little guides within the cell. Um, what else? Some of these vesicles contain digestive enzymes. So let me draw another one here. Here's a vesicle that's going to be called a lysosome. So it's one of these vesicles that plop off the Golgi. And this particular vesicle is packed with, uh, I'll also use red because red is protein here. So I'm just going to use red. It's packed with enzymes. Right, those red empty circles were the amino acids, and now I'm drawing kind of the darker red dots. My my proteins. Anyway, so these, uh, this is an example here of proteins, and more specifically, these are digestive proteins inside of a lysosome. So lysosomes are very specific uh, little organelles. They happen to be packed with digestive proteins. So these proteins, they're not channels in a membrane. They're not cytoskeletal proteins. Their job is to chop up structures. That's their job. They're enzymes and, and, and enzymes catalyze chemical reactions. And these digestive enzymes are there to basically break apart things. For example, if you are a white blood cell, you have lysosomes that are packed with digestive enzymes. So when these white blood cells gobble up a pathogen, the lysosomes will literally dump all these digestive enzymes on the pathogen. The cell just ingests it, and this pathogen will be destroyed by these enzymes. It will be all chopped up into pieces. So these little lysosomes are you know, very important little organelles, especially in white blood cells. Okay, I think I covered the major uh, organelles. Let now let's go through the actual slides and see what kind of details I didn't uh, mention. But you see, that's the big picture. Um, from gene to protein, mature protein, and different, basically, outcome of these different proteins, depending on what kind of role they have, whether they're membrane channels embedded in the membrane or their digestive enzymes that will be in you know, lysosomes or their structural proteins like the cytoskeletal proteins. All right. So let's see if I missed anything. So I'm going to go a little bit faster now on the slide because most of that I discussed it. Unless I didn't mention it in a drawing, I will kind of you know point it out over here. All right. So the nucleus contains uh most of the cell's DNA, so I, this is what I mentioned earlier. The, the DNA is complex with proteins, and the proteins, DNA uh, plus proteins, is called chromatin. And the chromatin, when it condenses, it will be called chromosomes. So let's make sure that we understand the, the difference. Chromatin and chromosomes are the same thing, but one is more condensed than the other. And what's condensed is basically very kind of like concentrated, pushed together. And why does a cell do that? Because during cell division, one cell will become two cells. And the genetic material is going to be divided into these two cells, right? The two daughter cells need to have the need to share the genetic material. So in order so we, that we don't lose anything, we just kind of package it up very tight first, and then we split it up. So chromatin becomes chromosome when 
we're dividing, when the cell is dividing, and we need to kind of just make sure everything stays together. So, um, so here's the nucleus, nucleopore, and those ribosomes waiting at, outside the pore. Nucleolus uh, happens to be a region within the nucleus. This is not an organelle. It's a region within the nucleus where we actually have something called uh, ribosomal RNA. I think I used green for RNA, so might as well do that. So ribosomal RNA is in the nucleolus as opposed to DNA is in the rest, is in the chromatin. So ribosomal RNA is basically what's going to make up ribosomes. And you're like, what? Ribosomes? Ribosomes is made of RNA as well. They read RNA. They're also made of RNA. Yes, they're made of ribosomal RNA. So ribosomal RNA plus proteins Ribosomal proteins equal ribosomes. <laughs> and ribosomes read messenger RNAs that code for proteins. All right. So chromatin and condensed chromosome structure. Here it is. There's the chromatin. The chromatin, if you actually zoomed in and looked at the chromatin fiber, what you would see is basically it's a super, super, super coiling of the DNA molecule. See, there's your DNA molecule, which is really a, you know, a, a helical structure. This DNA molecule wraps around proteins that we call histones in blue here. You see how that's, that cord is wrapped around this histone and around this histone. All these blue spheres, here, uh, sorry, gray balls here, all these spheres, uh, those are the histones in gray. Um, yeah, these complexes. So we have the smaller histones, the larger histones. So all of that complex allows for the wrapping of that DNA molecule into a, just a tighter structure. And it gets wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and wrapped so, so, so tight that you end up with what we call a condensed chromosome. And it's so tight, you actually can say that you can see it at the naked eye. And they usually look like little X's. Uh, if you look under a microscope at chromosomes of a dividing cell, they usually look like little X's. And one day you'll understand why it looks like an X. All right, so the nucleus is surrounded by this double membrane. I already told you about that, called the nuclear envelope. And if you look closely, the nuclear pores are basically these um, passages for, for example, the RNA to come out. And this diagram shows you how the membrane is actually a double membrane that folds inwards. And then you have the pores and it just basically keeps everything together. So this is the site of process of, of one or more uh, nucleoli, or nucleolus is the single of nucleoli. The nucleolus is the site of ribosomal RNA, which I already discussed earlier. So this is where the ribosomal subunits will be produced with the small subunit and the large subunit coming together to form a ribosome. And in the... If we have an electron microscope, we would literally see that. We would see a region that's a bit darker than everything else. So this is a sub-region of a nucleus that has a very specific role. And imagine, these pictures are something that, one, we can't see at the naked eye. So we're very lucky to have big, big electron microscopes. They use an electron beam to scan these very, very, very tiny cells. And we're able to see the structure inside these cells. And... You know, think about this. The first time these structures were described, we didn't know what these structures were and what they, what their role was in the cell. And uh, so every time you see a picture, think about that. Uh, and it took many, many, many years of research to really understand what's the role of 
the nucleus and what is the region nucleolus role is. So ribosomes are complexes of ribosomal RNA and proteins that synthesize proteins. There's a large subunit and small subunit. You don't really need to know the E site and P site, and uh, yet we will discuss that when we discuss how proteins are made. So ribosomes, they can be free in a cytosol or they can be bound to the endoplasmic reticulum. And if it's bound, we talk about the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And you can literally see that in a electron microscope. You can see these little teeny, teeny free floating or bound little dots. And again, it took a lot of research to figure out that it's made of two subunits and what the composition of each uh, subunit is. Okay, endoplasmic reticulum. It's a network of membranous tubules or sacs. We also call them cisternae. This will be a term you will see in the muscle cell, in skeletal muscle cells, um, where these, these, um, these sacs are called cisternae. So inside, you know, inside there is a space, it's called the ER lumen, and it's basically where the protein is being assembled. The amino acids are being assembled into a protein. It happens to be continuous with the nuclear envelope, and that's something I actually didn't specifically draw here. Let me see. I should have. I could have, you know, let's make some space here. Oops, I didn't mean to use gray. Right, so it's continuous with the nuclear envelope. So when something comes out, it literally ends up in the ER. That's really why. Okay. All right, so two types of ER, we already talked about that. So smooth endoplasmic reticulum, um, no ribosomes on the surface. Uh, and, and really, so it's involved in lipid synthesis. Uh, it's actually detoxification is gonna take place in a smooth ER. Now this is where Poisons and drugs are being uh, uh, you know, removed. And also, the smooth ER of a muscle cell it, uh, is called sarcoplasmic reticulum. And inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum, in that kind of like, you know, those sacs, right? That's why we call them cisternae. So they're basically like sacs, they're bags filled with calcium. So in a, in a skeletal muscle cell, it happens to be filled with calcium and it has happened to have a very, very important role for muscle contraction. So that's inside those sacs within the muscle cell. So for you, because you haven't yet seen what a muscle cell looks like, this might be a little bit kind of too much too soon for a muscle cell here. All of this is actually the inside of one cell. In blue is the SR, the sarcoplasmic, uh, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Don't worry about the words here. Z disc, M line, A band, I band. This this will come up in in the muscle chapter. Okay, in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, this is where we synthesize secretory proteins and membrane proteins and package them into transport vesicles. Okay, this is where we build phospholipids for their incorporation into the membranes. So you see how the vesicles come off and they move from one organelle to the next. So here from the ER to the Golgi, and then the vesicle plops off again and moves towards the membrane. So in the Golgi, we also call it Golgi apparatus, is also made of cisternae, and you see why we kind of drew it like this. And it happens to have a cis 
and a trance face to it. And basically, that's a directional uh, orientation of the Golgi. Uh, there are two sides, the cis side and the trance side. The cis face is the receiving side of the Golgi apparatus. And the trance face is the shipping side of the Golgi apparatus. So the molecule goes in from one side, gets rearranged, folded, clipped, carbohydrates attached to them, packaged, and then leaves on the trance side. And this is what we saw in a microscope. Okay, so one of these vesicles will actually contain um, enzymes. So lysosomes, um, it also has this membrane sac that contains enzymes to digest macromolecules. And it's usually in cells that do a lot of that digestive process. For example, um, white blood cells. But it's also for, you know, internal cleanup. If there's an old organelle, the lysosomes will kind of like chop it up and get rid of it. Hmm. Excuse me. So there is it. There it is. Here's a, a phagocytosis taking place. So you see, so they called it, uh, what are they calling this? Food, digesting food. Yeah in this particular diagram. So this is coming in and it's kind of sitting in the slice in, sorry, this in this um, food vacuole. And this will fuse with the lysosome. The enzymes in the lysosome will basically get released. And the job is to go and break down whatever food was brought in and you'll end up digested, digesting this food. Okay. Uh, oh, this is an interesting slide. This is about a vesicle that is actually digesting a, a mitochondrion. So this looks like a mitochondrion. And this is a peroxidome. This is one organelle I didn't talk about yet. So here we have a vesicle that's just like packed with two old organelles that it's trying to get rid of. This, there's the diagram that goes Excuse me. That goes uh, with the lysosome here. See how the membranes fuse here? There we go. Okay, that's one organelle I didn't draw in my first drawing, so I'm glad we're catching it here. Uh, vacuoles. Actually, not every eukaryotic cell will have vacuoles, but everything I mentioned so far, pretty much all the cells have that the nucleus, the ER, the Golgi, okay. But some cells have also additionally vacuoles. Um, it could be food vacuoles or central vacuoles. Food vacuoles are vesicles containing phagocytized materials. So we would just basically describe um, this. This would be a food vacuole here. Food vacuole. There we go. Um, as opposed to central vacuoles, where a large vacuole containing inorganic ions and water are found in a plant cells. So you have that in plant cells. You don't have central vacuoles in animal cells. Okay, so to go from the ER and reach the Golgi, you basically have to be packaged into a vesicle and the vesicle will float towards the Golgi. And within the Golgi, it's gonna blend into those membranes and release the content. And there'll be kind of, you know, folding happening and all of that. And, uh, and then these new vesicles will keep moving forward. So we call this the endomembrane system. It's one organelle releasing a vesicle that's going to fuse with the next organelle. There will be rearrangements of the content, protein content, and then you'll have yet another vesicle that plops up at the end. And here it is. And then it's going to finally end up at its final destination and be embedded in the membrane.
mitochondria have two membranes, an outer membrane and an inner membrane that's so much bigger, it's like forced to fold. The inner foldings are called cristae. You, you need to know that. Uh, and you can see them here, you see? That, so that, we're talking about that inner folding and this inner folding, and this is a folding, and this is a folding, and this is a folding. These are inner fold foldings that we call cristae. Inner membrane contains many foldings called cristae, just a specific term. Uh, and that divides the organelle into two internal compartments, the inner membrane and the outer membrane. And then you have a space between these two membranes. So we'll see in a future chapter how you know certain molecules are basically uh, sent into that intermembrane space. The matrix is that wider um, aqueous environment inside the mitochondria. So the mitochondrial matrix is basically the equivalent of the cytoplasm in a cell or the nucleoplasm in the nucleus. You have mitochondrial matrix in the matrix in the mitochondria. So this is the site of cellular respiration. This will be um, this usually gives PTSD to students because it's just so complicated of a process aerobic respiration, um, really the big picture, glucose in, water out um, with the use of oxygen. So oxygen in, glucose in, uh, what, what happens in the process? You end up exhaling CO2 gas. In the process, you produce some ATP, uh, uh, yeah, that's the goal, is to produce a lot of ATP molecules. Okay, so the mitochondria are very important for the cells. It's the site of cellular respiration where you have glucose plus oxygen is going to give you um, it's gonna give you uh, ATP in the end. I'm not gonna write any particulars. It's basically to give you ATP. Yes, you release CO2, that's what you exhale, but the goal is to produce ATP. That's the goal, because that's the energy currency. Okay, so who needs energy, right? Not all cells need as much energy. You know, uh, I don't know, I imagine hepatocytes in your liver, you know, don't, don't, don't need as much energy as, for example, look at this little sperm cell. Sperm cells need to swim, 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 and they're competing with millions of other sperm cells to get to that oocyte that was fertile, um, that was ovulated by that the female. Um, so the sperm cells, they have a flagellum, but they also have, and it's what we're ta talking about over here, they have Lots of mitochondria. In the middle piece of a sperm cell, it's very rich in mitochondria because we need a lot of ATP to move this flagellum. And actually, some infertility is caused by the lack of mobility of these sperm cells. So the male will have, you know, a number of sperm cells that might, the, the count might be right, but the sperm cells are just not moving enough. They're just not equipped to produce enough ATP to be moving enough. And if the number of cells is adequate, their mobility is inadequate, and that could be a source of infertility in couples. So in the future, we'll talk more about, hey, what's going on inside of the head of a sperm cell. We'll see it's really literally made of just the nucleus. And then here's a type of lysosome called acrosome. Um, and that's it. And lots and lots of mitochondria in the mid piece. And then uh, a, a big, big tail that will help the cell move forward. So, so who needs mitochondria? Uh, sperm cells. And also 
muscle cells. Lots of energy needed by both of these cells that are doing two different things, but they both need energy. All right, here's an example of an organelle I didn't mention earlier because I wasn't drawing a plant. Uh, chloroplast is an organelle that is only found in plant, and plants are made of eukaryotic cells. So they have everything we discussed so far, but additionally, we have an organelle that's only found in plants, and it's called chloroplasts. And um, inside these chloroplasts is where the magic happens, where energy from the sun, that energy is taken up by these chloroplasts, and these chloroplasts produce ATP. So I don't remember what color I drew ATP in. I'm just going to write ATP. So chloroplasts um, are, you know, have this double membrane, as you can see, and they have, oh, sorry. Um, yes. And, but they also, so what they have are what we called thylakoids. Thylakoids are these stacks of uh, grana. Yes, I was looking to see if that was labeled. Uh, so this is a granum, which is a sack, uh, sorry, a stack of grana. And this is where the magic happens of where the energy from the sun is going to be transformed into a molecule of glucose. Can you imagine? So just from the energy of the sun, you can create a glucose molecule, which is very important for um, for the plants. It's the source of the plants, source of energy for the plants. Okay. So that's happening at the thylakoids. The thylakoids are flattened, interconnected sacs, which may form a stack called the granum. And here we go. So this is a thylakoid, and they're stuck on top of each other. The thylakoid space is a space inside the thylakoid, and the stroma is the fluid outside of the thylakoids which contains the chloroplasts DNA and ribosomes and enzyme. Um, actually, it was thought that this was um, an entity on its own a long, long time ago. And then it blended with a eukaryotic cell and it became an organelle within that cell. So there's a little bit more detail here than you need to know. This is just like to tell you, hey, this is what's going on in a chloroplast, but I won't be asking you any details of that, but this is where sunlight is going to be captured by a photosystem inside of these thylakoids. And now that this photosystem grabbed onto that energy from the sunlight, it's going to allow the production of, of course, ATP and their reduction of special molecules that I'm just not going to get into that now. These molecules are going to be very important for the eventually production of organic molecules like glucose. I mean, nobody else does that. Plants are the only ones that can actually produce glucose um, out of basically just atoms <laughs> that are going to be assembled into glucose molecules. All right, so the endosymbion theory is what I was kind of saying a few, a minute ago, um, that early ancestor of eukaryotic cells, they were called proto-eukaryotes. What they did is that they engulfed an oxygen using uh, non-photosynthetic prokaryote, and that engulfed cell became an endosymbion um, Basically, and then became eventually later the cells mitochondrion. So they basically both benefited from each other. So one didn't die because of the other. Um, um, uh, so, th so that's the endosymbion theory. So this happened a very long time ago. 
um, I don't know, millions of years ago. And I don't have the, a, a time frame here. And this is the diagram that goes with that theory, where uh, just a regular eukaryotic cell engulfed what at the time used to be an oxygen using non-photosynthetic prokaryotes, so prokaryote uh, of its own, and then and then but after it got engulfed, it became an organelle within that bigger eukaryote. So this is the case for mitochondrion, and this is the case for um, pro, um, the chloroplast. So both, it's thought that both were at one point entities on their own, and then they were engulfed by bigger eukaryotic cells, and these ent entities became an organelle within the bigger cell. All right. Peroxisomes, I didn't draw them on the original diagram. Um, it's usually just one single membrane. They contain enzymes that generate a lot of hydrogen peroxide. And hydrogen peroxide allows for you know, the destruction of unwanted material. Cytoskeleton, I drew it on the diagram. It's a network of protein fibers. And every time you see the word fiber, think of something very, very long. And we have three types of fibers. I didn't mention them earlier in the drawing, but, but you should know them. Uh, we call them microfilaments of actin, microtubules made of tubulin, or intermediate filaments. You need to know these uh, three names, microfilaments, microtubules, and intermediate filaments. We'll talk about these microtubules, for example, and actin and tubulin. We'll talk about that in muscle contraction, for example. They're very important for muscle contraction. So this is a very nice table that summarizes these three types of uh, cytoskeletal proteins. Um, you know, I won't like really ask you any of these details on an exam, but it's kind of nice to see them compare to each other. They do not have the same diameters. They don't have the same functions. So overall, cytoskeleton in general gives mechanical support for the cell and helps maintain the cell shape. Um, it's just involved in various types of cell motility. And you can kind of appreciate that with these different examples here on the slide. Oops, this was posted twice. I don't know why. And this was the last slide. So this was a summary of, you know, the organelles, the typical organelles in the eukaryotic cell. Uh, so hopefully the drawing in the beginning and going through the slides was helpful to really see the big picture. Thank you.